what I um, would want you to actually emphasize on is um, the end of the days mm -hmm. and um, why it's very important for us to that's in the church to be you know like what you were saying um, at the restaurant that um, it's important for the believers to to get conversant with the the Hebrew Jewish mm. background and um, prepare to stand for the Jews mm -hmm. and uh, all the persecution and everything that is coming up yeah that's rising well you know one of the main one of the main reasons the Bible says the Lord is returning for a bride mm -hmm. right so if that's the case then the whole relationship that he has established is a is the bridal paradigm mm -hmm. the Hebraic um, bridal perspective excuse me and so much of the language in the book of Revelation is bridal type language Second Corinthians um, chapter 11, you know, Paul said that he has betrothed the dust of Christ like a chaste virgin, but he was afraid as the enemy Satan had deceived or beguiled Eve, we have been seduced with another gospel, another Jesus, another, another spirit. And what you see in Revelation 2 and 3 are those two spirits working concurrently throughout church history. You see the remnant of God's people, which are the church, and then you see a counterfeit Christian system typified by the white horse, red horse, black horse, and pale horse, all right? And so we get to the end of that, which is where we are now, but through those seven church ages, the, the remnant bride, the bride is sealed in. Revelation 19 says that the, the bride has made herself ready, then it goes into the marriage union there, and then the marriage supper. Those are two, it's two separate things. When he said in John 14, I go away to prepare a place for you, you have to understand the first century bridal perspective. Really, it's, there's four stages. Some say there's seven stages. And, and you probably could break some of the four down into seven. But the first, the first one is the, um, the agreement between the father of the bridegroom for the purchase of a bride the agreement for the purchase price, all right? So that's why it's important when you see in Revelation 5, he purchased for God men of every nation, tongue, tribe, and kingdom. The purchase price was his blood. So then you have the, the agreement, the covenant, the betrothal, which is binding. It's a binding contract, even though you have not consummated the marriage. So once the, the purchase price for the bride has been agreed upon, the bridegroom goes away back to his father's house to prepare a bridal chamber. Now, a lot of people have mistranslated that verse and say, you know, I have a mansion in heaven. Well, that's not talking about a mansion. That's talking about a place of intimacy where there's the union, the consummation of the marriage. Then they come out of that place and then they have the marriage feast. Oh, what Revelation 19 calls a marriage supper. So you have the, the coming of the bridegroom. The, the involvement of the Father, which was the Spirit, to, to um, enter into a betrothal contract with the, the future bride, and he goes away and prepares the place, then he returns, and he returns only when the Father lets him return. The, the date is set by the Father. And even in that scenario, there is a processional and there is a shout and a trumpet and all the things that Paul talked about in, in First Corinthians, uh, First Thessalonians four and all that. Shout the voice and the or the, or the, or the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. <clears throat> all of those are part of this bridal ceremony. There's a book that you probably would would enjoy. It's written by a, name, a man by the name of Alfred uh, Fruchtenbaum. Fruchtenbaum. He's Jewish. He's in his 80s now. His family came out of Russia uh, in the days of World War II, pre-World War II and during World War II. But anyway, <clears throat> he's a Jewish scholar. He's a believer. But he wrote a book, and Steps of the Messiah. And so I like a lot of his stuff. He got a few points that I don't agree with, but pretty much eschatology, his eschatology tracks with mine. 
and but he but he does so from a Jewish mindset. So it's really helped by reading some of his stuff to understand the whole first century Hebraic mindset of a wedding to even really understand the end of the age prophecy. So that's a big part of it. And, um, you know, then also understanding the fact that we rule and reign with Christ in the millennial age. All of that stems from understanding this perspective of the Hebraic mindset and the language of the first century. Now, that's not the only one. There are several things. The feast, of course, is another one. Um, understanding the feast because we are in tabernacles now. We're coming out of the Pentecost. Pentecost was the only feast that allowed leaven, but now we're coming back into a leaven-free environment where the Lord is um, sifting out of us the leaven, tradition, teachings of men, um, all of that, so that we can experience tabernacles. And even though the fullness of tabernacles won't happen until we are in the millennial reign, we can, we can still intro that on this side of that. We have an introduction, and the way we approach that is, of course, Hebrews 6, 5. Tasting the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. We taste millennial power. We taste tabernacles power. Now, you know, I don't know if you've heard me talk about this, but I, I believe we have misunderstood Peter's proclamation at the Mount of Transfiguration when he said, you know, let's build a tabernacle. All right, well, they said, oh, that Peter, he opened his big mouth when he should keep it shut. <laughs> that may be true. What he was really recognizing was that was Feast of Tabernacles application. Mm. It made him realize this is what the Feast of Tabernacles represents, God tabernacling with man. Let's build a tabernacle, a booth. So he connected the Mount of Transfiguration to the Feast of Tabernacles. Mm. Uh, not a lot Not a lot of people look at it that way. That's the way I felt like the Lord told me. When he said, let's build a tabernacle, he was relating it to what the implications are, the prophetic implications of the Feast of Tabernacles and and so forth. So anyway, that's kind of the, that's the uh, essence of that, of that part of it. To really fully understand the whole bridal concept, we have to understand the Hebraic mindset of the first century. And then you understand, when I saw that and read all the details, uh, this was about, when did I do this? Maybe a year ago when I really dug into the bridal stuff. I didn't just read one or two sources. I read multiple uh, different sources about really what was the first century bridal perspective. And you, can, you come away with the same general concept from all, even though some of them even go into more detail. But my point was, you really recognize Paul's understanding of that and in some of these phrases we don't really know until you understand the bridal concept what Paul was talking about and, and as it relates even to like 2 Corinthians 11 uh, and some other places where he talks about you know union and bride and the you know he, he even said himself in 2 Corinthians 12 I know a man in Christ right mm -hmm. <clears throat> that literally means I know a man in union with Messiah Mm. Well, that's bridal language. Mm. A man that has come into a, union, a, a union the way, of, uh, yeah, a complete union. And that's what he talks about the the bridal union of a man and a woman. Mm. It's a picture of the church and the bride of the Lord and all that, where he lives his life out through us. So that's it. That's the essence of that. So I think you was speaking yesterday, mm -hmm. and you talked about a little bit about this whole concept. I don't know, my, in my mind, something just um, opened up for me. All right, that's understanding the, that terminology, you know. I like when you said bridal language. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so there is what is called the bridal language. Yeah, I believe there is, the, the, you know, the, the, the phraseologies that okay. connect to that. And, you know, a lot of people don't recognize that, re that that John chapter 14 verses 1 through 3 is purely bridal language. Where he says, I go away to prepare a, a dwelling place for you. And, you know, in my father's house are many mansions. Mm. People don't realize that's, that's bridal talk. Mm. That's, you know, he says, when I go away to prepare the word there. And the English is trans translated mansions mm. in New American Standard dwelling places and that's not even really right. Mm. It's actually more like a 
bridal, it's like a cubicle is the, mm -hmm. the wording of it, but it's a place for marriage union. Mm -hmm. So if I, if I go away, I'm going to prepare a place for our marriage union. And when I've done that, I'll come back for you <clears throat> and take you back to my father's house. That just reinforces the idea that we, you know, we go to heaven. We have to be in heaven to experience the marriage union and the marriage supper. And then we return with him. That's a big deal because a huge percentage of the church right now doesn't even believe that. This whole thing about bridal union mm -hmm. is actually a spiritual thing. Mm -hmm. It's not a physical thing. Oh, absolutely. It's not, Purely. you know, and um, even when the uh, when um, was it Exodus that talked about the Lord um, setting a table mm -hmm. for the elders of Israel. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know. In my mind, I'm trying to figure out: is this a literal food? Mm -hmm. Or is it something spiritual that can be interpreted, you know, prophetically? Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, you know. Um, well, I, 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 I think a lot of it is spiritual for us now, but I do believe in in the millennial reign, we will it will be literal. No, no, no definitely. But for now, I think it's totally spiritual mm -hmm. that we, um, <clears throat> you know partake if you will we we devour we eat mm. the book we eat the revelation mm. and then become the revelation that's mm. the whole concept of that and you may be talking about this passage in uh, Isaiah 2 where it says his table is he, he's gonna wash away the refuge of lies from his table mm. is that the one you're talking about no the no. one what I'm talking about is when um, you know uh, he had called the whole of Israel into the mountain but they refuse to come into the mountain. Mm -hmm. And so what I always ask is, if he told them to come into the mountain, and if what, what would have happened if they accepted mm. and entered into the mountain? <clears throat> would it be a cave? Because I don't, mm. I don't, I don't, I, 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 this is my understanding. I believe somehow that when, when Moses or Moshe went into the mountain, the mountain was a portal. Well, I totally believe that. Uh, you know, because... I believe he was in the throne room. Uh -huh. yeah, no question. I mean, yeah. I believe Hebrews 10 tells us that. Yeah, because he said, <clears throat> uh, he said uh, make sure that you build yeah, according to what according I showed to what you. saw in heaven that's while right. you're on the mountain. mountain. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, so, so if he actually passed through that to the throne room, like mm -hmm. I said, what if the whole nation accepted the invitation mm -hmm. is there a cave that would have contained a whole nation mm, i don't know so i, I would i would think that the way he came in all right that's mm -hmm. moses mm -hmm. that's how all of them will have you know passed through that mountain to wherever Moses was going, because mm. oh, whatever yeah. he he wanted, to, whatever he wanted to do with Moses yeah. was what he wanted to do with the whole nation. Sure, he because did. he told it was, them it was an invitation of the whole yes, nation. Because he told and them. they said to him, "You go tell, you go visit, mm -hmm. come tell us what he said." Uh -huh. I believe that everyone could have experienced it. So everyone would have come down from that mountain with their faces lit up. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt about it. Now that, and that's a picture of where I think the end of the age will be. Well, this is not going to just be a few prophets that experience this union. And because it says the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Mm. All right. That's more than one person. That's going to be a community of people. Mm -hmm. And I think the glory is the Mount of Transfiguration, mm. Feast of Tabernacles, expression mm. of union. Mm. When he comes into a place of union, we carry the glory comes from the inside out, not just the outside in. No, it comes from inside out. That's right. So there is something inside, you know, Christ in you, right. the hope of glory. Hope glory. It's an abiding place. So we have the earnest now, mm. but we haven't entered into fullness. That's what it says in the book of Ephesians, you know, that we have as our down payment or earnest, mm. the the um, the spirit. All right? The spirit is the earnest in hopes of the fullness. Well, I believe fullness is when the Lord fully occupies us spirit soul and body mm. and then out of us mm. proceeds the glory now my revelation is 
that we participate with him to fill the earth with his glory. Mm. And if you see in Hebrews 6, when the seraphim were declaring holy, 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 mm. they were filling the temple with his glory. Mm. So when we prophesy the revelation of what we have seen and experienced, we release glory mm. into the atmosphere and fill the earth with, his, with the knowledge of the glory of God. <clears throat> That's what I believe the end time harvest will be. We have 80 million people still believing that uh, God doesn't do miracles. That's why we don't have any kind of um, real apostolic hubs that are really fully functioning to do, to prepare people to move in that. And I think one of the main reasons we don't, so few people really are, tr are preaching undiluted truth. So much of what is being taught is tainted by tradition and the opinions of men still even still especially in my nation now i don't know about nigeria you know <clears throat> but here you've got uh, some of the leading prophetic ministries in america that are still teaching falsehood i mean just gonna be blunt about it i can prove it prove it by the bible <laughs>